Hey ladies and gentlemen, and today I'm bringing you some breaking news that was sent to me by one of our great community members. And it's about the Surface and Transportation Board that had their big meeting at the end of April in Washington, D.C. It was a two-day meeting. And this is on how uh, some of these big rail companies and everything else, uh, Union Pacific to be exact, is really trying to put a big hurting on us folks. They're slowing down everything that's taking place. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you video clips so you have proof. You're going to listen to some of the stuff that is going on in this meeting. All right. Now, I'm not playing the whole thing because it is actually about nine hours long. So I'm going to cut out some key points to this. I want you to hear from the pilot uh, truck stop CEO that was there. And he's going to tell you exactly what's going to happen. If they cut by 50% Union Pacific on the rail cars, we're in a lot of trouble. So you folks need to pay attention, sit back, go get yourself something to drink, and listen to this information. So you all can't sit there and you look at me and say, well, where are you getting this information from? You're going to watch it right now. So we're going we're to have a full hearing. So Chairman Oberman, members of the Surface Transportation Board, Thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name is Shamit Konar. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Pilot Flying J. We operate the largest network of travel centers in the United States, serving the U.S. trucking industry and four-wheel customers. We currently account for approximately 20% of the country's highway, or as we call it, over-the-road diesel supply, 20% as well as 30% of the diesel exhaust fluid supply, also known as DEF. Similar to my colleagues here, Pilot is facing a threat of se severe reduction in rail service allocations. For Pilot, the service reduction allocations are being imposed by the Union Pacific Railroad. On April 13th, we were informed by the Union Pacific that we were required to reduce shipments by 26 percent. In subsequent conversations, we were asked to reduce them even further by 50 percent or face embargoes. We're not aware of any other company being instructed by the Union Pacific or any other railroad to reduce their shipments to the extent they're asking pilot. We understand through conversations with the Union Pacific that its allocations are based on a simplistic approach of looking at those shippers who have increased their number of shipments between January 2022 and March 2022. This does not take into account the overall number of shipments received at pilots' facilities, which, by the way, have remained static over this period. We believe the Union Pacific's approach does not fairly and proportionately allocate the supply issues because pilot has not increased the total number of cars it's received every month since January. What's actually happened is Pilot has become a shipper on some, uh, car, for some cars that we were not shippers before. So our facilities are still receiving the same number of cars. It's just the name of whose shipping has changed because we've taken control over some of the cars because of the issues we've had with the railroads so that we have the optionality to deliver these cars in markets that they can take, right? So the total number of cars has stayed the same. We understand and appreciate that the current market conditions are imposing significant constraints on the railroads, and we're committed to help ease this congestion. However, 26 to 50 percent reduction in our allocations will have substantial consequences for the markets. We, I would like to take this opportunity to take you through a few of the consequences that Union Pacific's mandate will have on the supply chain, the availability of fuel, and fuel prices. First, let me talk about the DEF supply chain. And just as a reminder, we supply about 30% of the DEF in the United States. The trucking sector is dependent on DEF. All trucks manufactured after 2010 cannot operate without DEF. And Pilot operates, if not the largest, one of the largest DEF supply networks in the country. We have 23 rail-served DEF facilities that make the DEF, and we have 18 rail transloaders. Of the 300-plus million gallons of DEF that Pilot supplies to the industry every year, 
74% is moved via rail. Union Pacific's restrictions will prevent Pilot from keeping many markets adequately supplied with DEF, likely causing shortages that will sideline trucks and reduce trucking capacity. Let me give you some context. A single rail car carries 21,500 gallons of DEF on average, okay? A single truck generally takes in seven gallons of DEF every time they fill. This is based on that data. So that implies that a single rail car is basically providing 3,000 trucks worth of DEF fills. For some more context, basically every rail car that gets missed in terms of DEF delivery will reduce trucking potential by 5 million miles. All right, that's a really big number, 5 million miles, because you've got 3,000 fills and DEF blends with diesel at a ratio of 2.7% for 100 gallons. All right, so 2.7 gallons of DEF allow a truck to drive 100, uh, to use 100 gallons. Furthermore, a reduction in freight transported by the UP will only add additional pressure on the trucking sector in general. The railways are pulling back. We got to move the stuff on trucks. If we can't supply DEF, there's more pressure on the sector and we let the sector down. Second, fuel availability and pricing. Let me begin with diesel. US diesel inventories today are running 10 to 15% below what they have been in the last five years at their lowest point. So if you take the minimum diesel inventory over the last five years, today we're fit 10 to 15% below that number. Certain markets like the Northeast, the West and the Southwest are even in a worse shape than the rest of the country. Renewable fuels like biodiesel, renewable diesel move exclusively on rail, on ships or on trucks. And there are no pipeline alternatives. Certain states like California, are heavily dependent on the imports of renewable fuels that are generally transported on rail. Fourth, over 50% of pilots' renewable diesel is transported on rail, and having our capacity cut by 50% would actually increase fuel prices in these states and potentially run out some of these locations. Let me now address the challenge with gasoline. In order for gasoline to meet the octane requirements required by engines 87 to 93 octane, you have to blend gasoline with ethanol to get to that level of octane so that you could use it in a car. Ethanol, like bio and renewable diesel, basically moves on trucks, ships, or rail. In certain markets like parts of Arizona, Nevada, Pilot, in partnership with Union Pacific, has actually developed ethanol unloading facilities and we serve majority of these markets. Cutting pilots' ability to ship ethanol from its plant in Nebraska to these markets by 50% will substantially reduce the amount of gasoline available in these markets because we can't blend the ethanol into the gasoline and would result in a further increase in prices during times when gasoline prices are up 48% since April 2021. To summarize, we believe UP's allocation logic is flawed, it's disproportionate, and unprecedented. If implemented, it'll have three impacts. There'll be a significant impact on DEF supply, potentially stranding a large number of trucks, a negative impact on diesel and gasoline supply and prices in an already challenged market, and it'll hurt our supply chain during times that we cannot afford it. On behalf of Pilot, our 70,000 trucking fleet customers and the million customers that we serve in our stores every day to keep America moving. I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify here today to describe the situation and highlight the potential consequences of the countries to the country if this is left unresolved. As mentioned at the beginning, we want to be part of the solution, but the current situation is untenable for us. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Do you have that are served by UP? I don't have the precise number of locations, but what happens is the UP brings in D, I'll talk about DEF, into 40 locations in the US and then we distribute it on trucks. So we've got 28, uh, 23 facilities and 17 to 18 transloaders. 
So once we create the DEF, we put it on the truck and take it out to our retail locations. But wholesale, it would be about 40 or 41. Forty-one places that UP delivers to you. Doesn't deliver to all of them, but uh, about seventy percent of it gets delivered by UP. And one of our challenges is DEF is made out of urea, so you know it's tied to the fertilizer industry. And UP actually is uh, single serve to a lot of urea manufacturing facilities. So even if I wanted to get somebody else to get the DEF, we couldn't. Next question, are there any places where uh, a switching order or there is some alternative could get you what you needed during this time? Right now, UP is responsible for over 40 or 45% of our DS supply. So if they had trackage rights, I mean, we've obviously gone and tried to talk to some other railroads saying like, hey, can you help us out? But uh, most of them are unable to because of the constraints they have on their system and they don't have trackage rights. Was the message that UP sent? That tell, tell us how they explained it to you. The way they explained it to us was they basically, and let me get the exact numbers. So they basically sent us a note saying that uh, in the last week, you shipped about 190 cars uh, for the week, and we want you to reduce it by 46 cars, basically about six cars a day. And, uh, and otherwise, we're going to embargo you. They gave us a week to do it, they have not embargoed us yet. And we haven't reduced the cars because we, we would be in deep trouble if you reduce the cars. Um, we have reached out back to the UP a number of times asking for either a meeting with their senior leadership so that we can explain the consequences to them. Uh, we've had our outside council reach, reach out to UP's outside council, but really have not had any engagement uh, back from UP at this point. The um so I thought you related it to the, they were saying the people who shipped a lot, those are the ones we're cutting. Is that the way you understood it? Yes. So they, they, they according to their metric, they feel like we've increased our shipments from January to March. What's actually happened is we've just taken over as shipper on a number of the cars. The total number of cars has not really changed. So, but if you look at it with pilot as the shipper, our, we have increased by about 60 cars a month. But in reality, those cars were coming to our locations anyway. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out a business model where a company says, please don't buy our product. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure somebody will explain that one to me before the day is out. Uh, now, at the time, you're, the railroads dropped these thousands of people in the, <clears throat> between March and June of 2020. I assume, like the rest of us, you had no idea when the pandemic was going to end. But what you did have an idea was to get people back and to hire new people was going to take 14 weeks, minimum. Now, I heard Ms. White had say that the collective bargaining agreement, did I understand you to say, required you to furlough people when traffic dropped? Said encourages, not requires. So, encouraged but not required. I mean, I'm really having a hard time understanding the sort of corporate planning that's throughout both. Both are, are the same. Now, my predecessor, Ann Begeman, had the foresight sometime in mid-2020, as I recall, to write letters to all the CEOs saying, what are your plans to staff up to be able to handle the... Uh, return of traffic and traffic was already returning. We saw it, you know, we don't run railroads here, but we saw it and we got assurances. And I became chairman a year and a half ago and I followed up in the spring and I'm having trouble to be honest, accepting what I'm hearing here today. So I wrote a letter to, this farmer, and I got an answer on June 9th of 2021. The pandemic was already underway for a year, 
and the traffic had already returned to a large extent. I know it's still growing. And Ms. Farmer wrote me on June 9th, <clears throat> with regard to our employees, I'm quoting, we have sufficient train crews and yard employees for current values. <clears throat> she went down, our 2022 hiring plan is highly dependent on volume levels in determining the timing of bringing on transportation maintenance and other personnel to support growth. And she concluded, BNSF has and will continue to take the steps to ensure that we have the right resources to meet new demand levels while providing consistent and reliable service. BNSF has demonstrated our ability to increase our resources with great speed in response to changing circumstances, and I am confident in our ability to do so now. I sent a letter to Mr. Fritz, same letter. I got his answer June 11th, 2021. Quote, Union Pacific is well positioned to deal with the nation's economic recovery in 2021. As demand has increased across our network, we have quickly identified those growth areas and strategically placed crews to serve customers. Our pipeline of trained crew, yard, and maintenance employees is robust. And these employees are qualified to fill future positions throughout our network. Now, you know, I've only been chairman for a few months, been around for a long time, so maybe bad on me to be so naive. We felt, I thought, reassured. We didn't implement a weekly reporting, which we've been urged to do now. But I just have to tell you that I hear what you're saying and I've seen your charts, but I'm taking it with a heavy dose of skepticism. The CEOs aren't here to defend their letters, but they sent you. And I'm trying to figure out what is it that's changed. The C CEOs are still there. PSR is still there, which is what I don't blame, but many people blame. The OR is still there. Wall Street's still there. So what is it? You know, we sit here. We're, we're not just some entity that rides herd on you because we like to hear ourselves talk. We're the public. That's why we exist. And we, I think all five of us do our best to represent the public interest up here. So th this is not, you know, what your balance sheet looks like. As I said yesterday, this is the price of bread going up. This is ethanol not being mixed with gasoline and the price, prices are high at the pump. So I, I'm, I'm having a lot of trouble with this, that you dropped thousands of employees when the pandemic began apparently without any notion that you might have to gear up. Eric, you said that the current congestion was due to unanticipated uh, demand in the, just this last spring. Well, what was unanticipated about it? I mean, weren't you watching the trends in the summer of 2020 as the economy recovered? Now, maybe you couldn't hit it with precision. So, You just said, somebody just said, I think it was you, Eric, we have enough locomotives. The April 8th, 22 numbers have the <clears throat> among the highest level of trains held for power in the last five years. And they've been going up for the last few weeks. They also have among the highest levels of trains held per crew, for crews, and, and BNs in the same. So how do you say you have enough power? You got thousands of locomotives in, in storage someplace, and you don't have enough power to power the trains that are sitting out there on the tracks and that are not delivering grain trains to chicken farms, 20% cut in the fertilizer shipments, which I guess you rescinded. I mean, what are we supposed to expect here 
And just to take your word for it, don't re-regulate. So I, I'm having trouble with it. I, I'd like to ask you, you take a, your turns to respond to these points. Thank you. Today is was not new. I've been hearing this for a year about signal men covering territory that they can no longer physically cover, car men being limited to one minute a car for inspections. Before we meet again, I'd like to invite one of the people in the C-suites here to contact these guys, meet them in the yard, and you physically watch them, what they're going through, and then come back. So we have the same database. Uh, I find it very frustrating. Either they're in a car or they're not. I didn't hear any deception from these people. And if you don't know, as you said, Eric, the, seeing what's going on out there is one of the best ways to keep track of it. And I know you're all busy. But based on the level of reports I have heard about this, and I may visit one of your yards myself sooner rather than later, uh, but I think you, somebody at this table, how to walk around the trains with these car men and see what they're saying. And then you see if that's the way you want your railroad to operate. And then you tell us. And we'll hear back from them as well.